Okay. Um, hello, everyone. If you need it, you Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to start by just briefly thanking the organising committee for the invitation to speak. If you've looked at the programme, you may notice I'm on the organising committee, but I didn't invite myself, I promise. Um, and because I'm a member of the committee, I feel it's probably my duty to try and make up some time so you can all have some lunch. So if I do end up whizzing through a few points, it's probably because I've already been covered. And if there's anything that anybody wants to discuss over lunch, they can feel free. So I would like to talk to you about molecular tools for nucleic acid and protein detection. Uh, I'm going to focus on invasive aspergillosis initially. Um, I want to look at two areas. Firstly, um, nucleic acid-based tests, focusing on real-time quantitative PCR. And secondly, on antibody-based tests. And I'm going to focus primarily on, the, on OLM's uh, lateral flow device, which you've already heard about, and on BioRad's Galactaman and ELISA. And what I'd like to do is briefly highlight some of the limitations of these assays, not to be too negative, but just to make people aware of some of the limitations and then um, present a little bit of data on the work that we're doing at Anglia Ruskin University in Chelmsford to develop some novel diagnostic methods that hopefully overcome some of these limitations. So briefly, and I'll just gloss over it, just a few qPCR limitations. Now we know that qPCR can be incredibly sensitive and incredibly specific. We know that a good assay can detect fewer than five copies of your target nucleic acid. And we know that a well-designed assay will, um, with 100% specificity, um, identify your target pathogen. Unfortunately, one of the main limiting factors with qPCR is the need to purify nucleic acids beforehand. And there are many methods available for the purification of nucleic acids. And this introduces a lot of variability. It also introduces a massive contamination potential, especially when you're looking at something like aspergillus, which is ubiquitous in the environment. So I included this just as an example of something that we too often see in um, real-time PCR. Um, this amplification curve, the blue shows a positive sample um, testing for aspergillus, and the reds are actually our no-template controls. So this should be all of the reagents, but excluding any templates, so they shouldn't amplify at all. Now the problem happens, this problem happens, when we load a PCR plate anywhere near where we've performed our DNA extractions, or anywhere near the microbiology or mycology labs where they're um, culturing and handling clinical samples. And all too often it occurs when you're extracting on a day when the room is very busy and the doors flung open and closed many, many times. And this is something that's a very limiting factor with the sensitivity of qPCR. Because if you have a clinical sample such as a serum sample where you're looking at very low levels of detection um, and you're looking at very low levels of fungus, um, you will see amplification very, very, very late, and then you're likely to see NTCs coming up in around the same place, and you can't distinguish contamination from real uh, target. There is also the massive problem of a lack of standardization. I won't really go into it because I think it's, it's been covered to an extent I think people are well aware of. But just to say, obviously, the European Aspergillus PCR Initiative are working to standardize um, PCR and have published guidelines on uh, DNA extraction protocols. And in terms of the um, PCR assay itself, there are new and emerging CE marked aspergillus qPCR kits. Um, I'm just, uh, no bias, but I'm just going to mention the um, pathognostics assay briefly because at um, Anglia Ruskin we've been taking a look at this assay. Uh, it's now CE marked for respiratory samples only and commercially available. And this assay offers um, two multiplex reactions. So the first is a species um, multiplex, and it runs in three channels, so you can use it to identify aspergillus species, pan aspergillus species, but it will also specifically identify terrius and fumigatus. And the second kit is um, a resistance kit, which um, identifies four common azole resistance genes. So we have actually just looked at, briefly looked at the um, species kit and just a, a little bit of data that we've generated in the last few weeks. We've established a limited detection of the assay of around 40 femtograms of aspergillus genomic DNA. In terms of specificity, um, we didn't find any cross-reactivity with candida species. 
we didn't find any cross-reactivity with penicillium. We did find cross-reactivity just in the Aspergillus species probe, not in the Fumigatus or Terrier specific probes, with Rhizopus arising. Um, but this was only when we loaded a very, very high fungal concentration. And um, when we did load something like 50 picograms of Rhizopus arising, you did see amplification very, very late. So it, it suggests very inefficient amplification. And indeed, we went back to pathognostics, and in the latest version of their kit insert, they do state that a high load of rhizopus will be amplified. Uh, we didn't see any cross-reactivity with human DNA. So, brief summary, it, we've seen that it does exactly what it says on the tin. So, there are other assays emerging, and this may help us move towards, sorry, this may help us move towards standardization of qPCR protocol. Of course, something important to consider with commercial kits is where they are going to be priced and whether they're going to be priced reasonably enough for any of us to take advantage of. But that's something we'll, uh, we'll see. Um, the last major limitation of qPCR for um, amplification of and detection of pathogen DNA is to say that detection of the DNA doesn't tell you that you have an infection. Um, you don't know that the organism is viable, you don't know that it's active growth, you don't know that it's capable of causing infection. And that's a possible limitation with qPCR, something that may be overcome by combining it with another test, such as the lateral flow device, which I won't go into because we've heard all about it, but obviously you're looking at um, a marker of active growth. I'm just going to highlight two limitations of the lateral flow device, obvious limitations. A qualitative result, so you're just looking at the appearance of a line. Is it there, yes or no? And you also clearly have a relative insensitivity when it's compared to something like real-time PCR. Another antibody-based detection method would be galactaman analyzer, which I'm not going to go into because everybody's familiar with, but there are a number of well-documented limitations to this assay. Um, there are widely reported sensitivity and specificity data because of variation in the cutoff that's used, because of um, heterogeneous study populations, because of the definition of a positive, where people use a single positive result, or whether they have two consecutive serum samples from a patient to define positivity, uh, to name but a few. There is also a possible specific, or a definite specificity issue. Maybe the EB2A antibody is not as specific as we'd like. Um, there have been reports of cross-reactivity in cases of histoplasmosis, cryptococosis, and uh, fusarium, to name but a few. And lastly, a possible reproducibility issue. Now, I know it's an awful slide, and Stephen's going to hate me for this slide, but it's just to highlight that um, eight publications since from between 2005 and 2014 eight publications that have reported um, a lack of reproducibility of galactaman and testing, um, it, particularly in serum samples. And you would see, oh, does you say this works? Oh, you can see anyway. But actually a publication, um, one of these publications is our own from Bart's Health and Queen Mary University. And we have certainly seen a problem with repeat testing of initially galactaman and positive serum samples which are very often negative on repeat from the same sample within 24 hours. I'd just like to highlight this paper um, from last year, a single paper that boldly claimed that there is no signal loss and there is no instability of galactamanan. Um, we did, I don't know if anyone saw it, but we did um, have a comments letter published on this, um, on this paper where we highlighted that there are some limitations of this work where there actually was no cl clinical information on the patients, no details of their diagnosis or drug treatment, which may be important. Also, um, all of the samples were pooled. So if you have any confounding factors from a patient, um, they can end up in the pooled samples. And also, if you look at the data, samples did show loss of signal post-storage. So I advise you to check out the paper. <laughs> And following our um, comments letter, a second comments letter was sent in from a second group who highlighted concerns and also stated that they have seen signal loss. So there seems to be a, an awful lot of data showing that there is a problem of some kind.
And this could have implications in settings where there is a delay in sample testing, for example, when it's sent off for testing. Oh. Um, that's it for highlighting limitations of the assays. Just to say that, as, as has already been touched on by Rosemary and by Mansell, um, a combination of these tests might help to, uh, to remove some of these limitations. And I know that Rosemary and Lewis have been using a combination testing method for some time. Several institutions have. I just wanted to comment that um, at Bart's Health, we are now using a combination test. Uh, this is um, Triadex, an initiative that's being led by Public Health England, where within the trust we are currently offering um, galactomannan, lateral flow device, and an in-house um, aspergillus PCR. And the turnaround time for the three tests is within two working days. So the aim of this is to, is to help and assist the clinicians in the antifungal management of high-risk patients. But what else can we do? Well, we could develop novel molecular tools, and that's something that we've been looking at at Anglia Ruskin University. Now, this isn't actually a picture of a lab from Anglia Ruskin. If there are any Harry Potter fans in the audience, you will recognize it as the potions lab from Hogwarts. But I have often heard some of, the, um, some of our in-house assays referred to as our witch's brews. So maybe there's some similarities. But what we wanted to do was look at a novel approach where we can take the specificity of antibody detection, more specifically, antibody that's targeted to an antigen that is actively released during active growth of aspergillus as a marker of active growth. And we wanted to combine it with the exquisite sensitivity of real-time PCR. And proximity ligation assay, or PLA, makes that possible. So, the proximity ligation assay was um, originally described by Fredriksson and colleagues from Sweden in 2002 in Nature Biotechnology. I'm just going to briefly describe the chemistry of it. You take two monoclonal antibodies that um, are specific for two adjacent epitopes on your target antigen. And to each of these, you attach a different single-stranded oligonucleotide tail. One of these has um, a, a, a free three-primed end. The other has a free five-primed end. So what you do is you incubate your clinical sample with these. These are called probes once you've attached your um, antibodies to your oligo. So you incubate your sample with these probes. And if your antigen is present, then your probes will bind, will bind to adjacent epitopes. This brings the oligonucleotide tails into proximity. You have a linker oligo, which is complementary to the three primed end of one and the five primed end of the other, which if these two come into proximity, it will bind and it will bridge the gap between them. You then have a ligation reaction, which seals the gap. And this creates a template that is amplified by real-time PCR and detected by fluorescence. And the output is very familiar. You see an amplification plot. But this time, it doesn't represent copies of your target nucleic acid of a pathogen. It represents ligation events. Something that I will point out, which I'm sure Stephen will highlight in his talk, is um, the position of the negative control. Now, the blue line and the pinky kind of line are both positive samples that contain target antigen. The horrible brown color is actually a negative control, known as an, a, um, yes, it's actually a negative control of the assay, so it's a no protein control in MPC. Now you'll see that there's an amplification curve. This isn't a mistake, this happens with proximity ligation assay. Because we're using a homogeneous assay, it's all in one, there are no wash steps. So in this assay, two probes may come into proximity by chance without the presence of the antigen, and the oligos may ligate and you will have amplification. Now, the key to this is to minimize the background ligations in order to have a clear difference between a negative and a positive result. And that's where assay optimization is crucial. I won't go into it, but a slight variation on it is the proximity extension assay, same basic chemistry. But when you come to the um, oligos coming together, you don't have a ligation event. You have uh, one of the oligos using the other as a template for extension, and then it's this template that's um, amplified and detected. Now, we're using the proximity ligation assay. It has several advantages over traditional ELISA. I've listed them here, 50 to 500 fold more sensitive, um, a broader dynamic range of around 5 log versus 2.5, 
a much simpler workflow. There are no wash steps. The hands-on time is, in fact, less than 20 minutes. And a faster time to result of around two hours versus three to five, depending on how many samples you have in your ELISA. This is just a little bit of data from our Aspergillus PLA. So we challenged it with a whole array of culture filtrates of clinically relevant fungi and found that it was specific for Aspergillus. We also compared the results of the lateral flow. And we also ran serial dilutions of an Aspergillus culture filtrate and demonstrated that we had detection over five log. Um, the, the point that's out on its own at around 0.00001 actually represents our no protein control. So we, we, need to have, we need to have a cutoff for a clear distinction between how far we can dilute our sample and where our MPC appears. And this is a similar dilution curve for um, purified antigen target. And we ran these dilutions um, in the PLA and also on a lateral flow device. And I hope, I hope you can see the lines clearly on here. But with around 5,000 nanograms per mil of target, you can see that the lateral flow device is a strong positive. And you can also see that the PLA is a very strong positive. You have a CQ of around 23.5 whereas the negative control is around 30.5. When you go down to around 500 nanograms per mil, you still have a positive on the lateral flow device, but it's incredibly weak. I'm not sure it shows up, but I promise you it's there. Um, you still have a very strong positive on the PLA. By the time you get down to 50 nanograms per mil of target, the lateral flow can't pick it up, but the PLA is still a strong positive. And down to five nanograms per mil, the PLA still clearly detects positive. So we're looking at at least 100 times more sensitivity um, for the PLA in comparison to the lateral flow device. What next? Well, we are applying this technology to several clinically relevant pathogens. We want to look at multiplex assays. Uh, we'd also like to look at an isothermal application to remove the need for a real-time PCR machine. And we're also dabbling with digital PCR, digital PLA, which Stephen will um, go on to tell you about. So I'd just really quickly like to thank our um, research team at Anglia Ruskin University. In particular, they're in the audience, doctors um, Sarah Covell and Helen Moore, who performed all of the um, pathognostics evaluation, and um, collaborators Chris Thornton and Samir, and our sponsors, in particular OLM, who are funding this research project. And I'd just like to say thank you for your attention.